Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, National Director of Churches of Welcome at World Relief, and today we're talking with Mark Matlock, Mark's Senior Fellow at Barna and a facilitator of Innovation and Impact. He's also director of Urbana Missions Conference for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and an author whose latest book is Faith for the Curious, How an Era of Spiritual Openness Shapes the Way We Live and Helps Others Follow Jesus. If you enjoy our interviews, make sure you like and follow us on Apple Podcasts. Now let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Dean of the Talbot School of Theology. Hey, Mark, we've known each other for a while, and I'm super excited we could have this conversation. You brought a lot of wisdom to a lot of different places, and I shared some of that in the intro, but but this this book, I think, is really, at, well, it's a gift at the right time. Your book looks at kind of a specific segment of the population, people you call the spiritually curious. And I think that language, you know, I've heard the language, you know, curiously open or spiritually open and curious. Um, I, I think it's good, helpful language, because the assumption is, is that the to use a common term maybe in the past, the unchurched are a monolithic block and they're not a monolithic block. Tell us about this group, the spiritually curious. Curious. Yeah, well, you know, we were doing research at Barna with, you know, he gets us, American Bible Society, Alpha, a lot of different groups. I started noticing that there was this group that was about at the time about 90 million people uh, in our that would represent that in the population that didn't really fit the normal like characterization a lot of us think of when we think of the unchurch and some of their behavior show that they had like really deep uh, connection to spirituality, but not necessarily Christianity and that they were kind of like seeking um, spiritual encounters. And I thought, you know, what if we're missing something in the way that we're framing out those that are outside the church and maybe we're not connecting with them in the way that could best help them, um, know who Jesus is. So that was kind of how I got into all that. And and I think it's, again, worth noting that um, our, our audience is pastors and church leaders, and they're teaching people in their churches to share the gospel, which mm-hmm. I hope they are. We, we want all to be uh, participating and sharing the good news of the gospel. And what happens is when you don't tell people that, you know, the unchurched are not this monolithic block, and they go out and they share some, and this immediately reject them. They kind of assume that everyone is not open, or no one is curious as well. But there are distinctions between them. So let's talk a little about that. first. Yeah. Um, what? Give us a little more about what sets apart the spiritually curious from other non Christians or unchurched people. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing we need to realize is that while they're spiritually curious, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're interested in Christianity per se. Right. So we can still feel a little bit of like maybe a rub against that a little bit um, and a little maybe skepticism toward Christianity. But what we need to realize is that they are spiritually seeking and therefore kind of how we engage them and approach them is what's really critical. And so what we did was we actually measured like how strong their belief was in the supernatural world and then also cross index that with a, a measure for curiosity. And we define curiosity as being as using two factors. Um, one was stretching, where they're actually looking, seeking uh, new experiences and exploratory in the way they are. And then the other was embracing, which had to do with um, being okay, living in the tension of uncertainty, as opposed to having everything figured out. And what we found was that there is this group of spiritually curious people that were actually more curious than even practicing Christians were. Mm-hmm. Um, the group that was uh, the smallest in our in our kind of segmentation was actually this group of people that were what we would call naturalists, that pretty much believe the physical world is all there is, there isn't anything that kind of happens after we die. And there's this larger group in the middle that make up about 54% of the population that have high curiosity and they believe that there is more to be experienced beyond the physical world. So we have to kind of start there with that kind of a framework and kind of realize that when we talk to somebody, it's a pretty good chance they believe there's more out there. Um, but we don't necessarily know or get to assume what it is they believe about that. And that kind of is what starts maybe our posture a little bit different than maybe how we've done evangelism in the past. 
No, for sure it would. I mean, they would impact her posture deeply. And I think I was thinking of a stat that I, you know, I'm, I think of stats. It's weird, yeah. but then every time I quote a stat, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> Me too. Um, I try to stay away from the stats and get to the insights. But you know, it's hard not to when you. Do I know. This kind I know. Of stuff, just a right? couple. Just a couple. I yeah. mean, you're, you know, we, we're all in the we're in that, that research, research world. nerdy thing. Yeah. I know. I know. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't 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 let anybody shame you for that, brother. This could be <laughs> the whole point of our podcast. Don't let people shame you for stats unless you use fake stats unless you use bad stats don't do that don't say stats like 90 percent of pastors don't make it to retirement that's a fake stat don't say anyway i'm going to stop right there okay 88 percent of evangelical youth drop out of church or high school never to return don't say that but for real stats <laughs> one of the interesting things that i was reading a journal article about was um uh, iceland has a it's very much post-christian which mm -hmm. it has a great gospel story centuries ago but it's very much post-christian um, and you would find that people are just not open to a lot of what Christian, not, not all of them, but a lot of people are not open mm -hmm. to that, but they have some of the highest percentage beliefs in elves and fairies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, part of that comes back to the history, historical background. So, so those people would fit in some of the categories. They're open to yes. spiritual things. So it's not that it, it's not, it's not that like the, the Engel scale is a famous representation of, of, you know, how far a person away is from understanding the gospel it starts with, mm -hmm. is there a God? And, you know, an awareness of, of God through in Christ and, you know, awareness of our own sin. They're not on the angle scale. They're not like moving that direction. I mean, they could be on the angle scale, but they're like in another, it's another category mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And, and that category though means that Christians, well, do have an opportunity to say, well, what about this? Let, let, let's talk about this, et cetera, et cetera. So talk to us a little bit about the difference between uh, the spiritual curious and practicing Christians, because I'm guessing that all of my audience is practicing Christians and are pastoring uh, practicing Christians. So what's what's the distance? What's the difference? What's the is there a chasm between them? Tell me about that. Yeah, there are some that we would call curious skeptics. So they're curious. They believe there's more out there. You know, we might typically want to refer to those people as agnostics, but it's diff It's a different thing. It's more. I believe this, but I am skeptical about the experiences. And a lot of that has to do because of past experiences with uh, Christianity. In fact, our research shows that, you know, with this large, you know, this rise of the religiously unaffiliated in the United States, that over half of them, about 55 percent, grew up in a Christian home. So they have some familiarity with Christianity and a lot of times they're looking for something more. And so. Uh, that's really critical. And so I kind of take the approach of um, thinking about uh, how the Apostle Paul admired, you know, when he was on Areopagus, you know, I see you're a very spiritual people. You know, you've got all these idols rather than going ah, oh, you know, you evil people worshiping these false gods. He admires their spirituality and then leads them to Christ. I think we have to kind of take some of that same thing of really starting by finding out where people are coming from, what their spiritual journey has been. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, some writing that C.S. Lewis did talking about post-Christianity back in the 1940s and 50s. And he talks about how a post-Christian person is very different than a pre-Christian person. Kind of like a lot that's never been built on is different than a lot that was built on and was cleared off. And that's kind of the kind of person that we're dealing with is they're living in a culture that's been exposed to some moral principles. Uh, one of my one of my favorite stories, in fact, in the book is, you know, I'm talking to this this guy who says, I don't need the Bible to help me with my morality. And I go, well, you know, how did you develop your morality? He goes, well, you know, the things that everybody knows. And he gives me like, you know, seven different principles of his morality. I'm like, you do know that those are like seven of the 10 commandments. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, really? You know, he never put the two together, but yet they were enough that he could articulate them in his life. And so we're living in a really interesting time, but finding out people's history is really important. Um, you know, do they believe in elves and fairies? Are they reading their tarot cards? Are they consulting Ouija boards? And our research shows that, that actually a lot of Americans aren't really exploring a lot of these occult uh, practices in huge numbers, but the spiritually curious are doing more of that than the average population. And what we need to do as Christians is, is instead of maybe being offended or shocked or horrified by that, realize, hey, this is a person who is actively seeking a more intense encounter with the spiritual world. How do I help them meet the ultimate person, Jesus Christ? 
And, um, and that starts by being curious about them and genuinely curious about them um, rather than making a bunch of assumptions about what they know or trying to, you know, plug the hole in their soul with our, you know, truth bomb. Yeah, totally. And I, I was I was on a, a Zoom call. I'm preparing for my um, my Oxford class in December. I teach at Wycliffe, and we work with the Anglican and Ordinands, and I bring my Talbot students. And so it's evangelism. And 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 I, we had a great conversation about that very thing. Is that uh, reading Shauna Pilgrim's book and talking about you know having actually some conversation, having being curious, having a humble posture, and more. And and I think it really resonates. Some students were already there comfortably, but for other people, it really resonated with them as almost like new news. So, so I think the curiosity here, but it's also messy. It's um, you know, messy. we a lot of a lot of us have been um, watching the Russell Brand, uh, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's been fascinating. I mean, oh, totally. I, yeah, I, I could have done without the baptism in his tidy whities, but um, <laughs> but the but this week at the time we're recording this, you know, he held up his magic amulet that keeps bad things away. And it's like, this is the same guy like a couple of weeks ago who's quoting Tim Keller or Rick Warren or C.S. Lewis. And now he's holding up his magic amulet and, you know, and every, you know, everyone erupts. And I'm I'm kind of like, you know, this is not unexpected behavior for somebody who's sort of just figuring these things out. And you got a whole life that is a, is, is, is a mess and problematic and everything else. So 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 what I would say is when you start engaging some of these spiritually curious people, I mean, in a sense, they're they're already curious and probably engaging and looking at other things. Yes. So, how then do you? How, where does Christianity? Is it? Do we take the approach to, hey, here's another God among all the gods you're seeking, or yeah. this is the God you're seeking? I mean, help me frame that in a category. Yeah, you know, and I think a lot of it is like we have been so trained in evangelism methods that we don't realize how those are sometimes maybe hurting us in our approach yeah. to the curious. Um, what was meant to help us do good and do better is actually maybe working against us when it comes to the curious. So like an example of that is the idea that people have a hole in their soul and they're trying to fill that hole. That's that's Augustine. Don't you don't know? like don't dismissively. <laughs> I'm at the Talbot School of Theology. Augustine. I know. Like there's I a know. God, God shaped hole is the popular way to put it, but it's basically our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Is what yes. Augustine would well, say so in King James English. I, I believe that there's a, something that we're searching for, but it may not be the hole that's like a void that okay. I'm in despair over, right? And so the way I like to think about it is it's not like, and we're finding this, you know, that people aren't sitting there asking these existential questions about what is my purpose in life? How do I fit in the world? My life is meaningless. And we're kind of taught some of those frames in our evangelism methods and that this truth, these, these truths about the gospel, you know, will help fill that. And what I found is the, the void that's in people's life is actually the, difference between what's remaining of the image of God in them. So if we think about Mm -hmm. the image of God being that mirror that reflected the glory of God um, in all of us as human beings and sin fractures that mirror, people have this little shard of God's image in them and it's trying to get bigger, especially in a post-Christian culture where they have, we have time and space to reflect on that and to think about it and go, boy, I feel this thing and I want more of it. And so what a lot of people are looking for in their spiritual pursuits is not like answers to their biggest, darkest questions, uh, or they've got this emptiness inside that they're trying to plug. They're looking for an upgrade. They're trying to figure out how do I do this thing that I'm feeling deeply about inside more and better? And they're searching for that. And unfortunately, you're like, Justice could be one of those things that they're searching for. And so they've got a heart that sees the evil and the wrong in the world and they're fighting against it. But without Jesus and without his framework, they don't really have the tools, the equipment, the relationship, the Holy Spirit in them to really act justly. Um, They may want to be creative. They may want to care for people. They may want to live a generous life. And, And there's something inside. And so I'm always looking for where is the image of God trying to get bigger in somebody's life? And how do I help connect that to um, Jesus and to Jesus-like qualities and show them that Jesus is the one to follow to do more of that thing? And that is what I found has been like, like people are surprised. Even people that have grown up in a Christian home or around Christianity are like, nobody's ever talked to me about Jesus that way. And so that's where some of our training that was meant to help us be efficient 
uh, you know, um, kind of maybe clouds our view of what really is going on in their life. Another thing is just the idea that, you know, a lot of our evangelism methods were designed to be real efficient so that we could share the gospel with as many people as quickly as possible. And the reality is, while that may have worked in a day when there, we were kind of in more of a Christian worldview kind of a society, um, we have to have a lot more patience with people and realize that when we start a conversation, it's probably a conversation that's been going on in their life and will go on for a long time. And so I'm all also looking for when I interact with a curious person, where's God already been in their life? Where's he already shown up for them? Not assuming that I'm the only person and that I only that I will be the only person in their life either. Um, that's a different posture, I think, than a lot of what we've been taught. Yeah, and I would say that there's a clear sense that uh, people uh, who are open, who are spiritually curious, are going to be already, in some level, engaging or thinking about something else. So it is a redirect to that conversation. But and, and you also in the research, uh, well, also, and, and I should say too, by the way, the book the book name is the book's name is Faith of the Curious: How an Era of Spiritual Openness Shapes the Way We Live and Help Others Follow Jesus. Uh, one of the longer subtitles in the world today. Yeah. But again, Faith for the Curious is a good, simple way to put it as well. But part of the reality is, is there is some, uh, and you do, uh, and the book is a mix of, it's got some research, but also, you know, your own journey, your own yeah. engagement, which I love. Um, yeah, I love that so da why, David uh, in the forward, uh, David Kinnaman in the forward, he, he didn't call me a data nerd. He called me a data storyteller, which I really liked. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to say, that's one of the things I like about the book is you're telling some of those personal stories and personal experiences. So why then are non-Christians or some subsets of non-Christians hostile towards Christianity? Well, you know, once again, very small percentage of people that are really set in their ways. Um, yeah. So we're talking like 10% of the population. So most people are open to having a conversation about spiritual things, but they also tell us that they don't want conversations, spiritual conversations that force a conclusion and that are designed to convert them. Right. And so, um, which isn't hugely surprising, but it also makes us go, well, then how do I, how do I approach people when I'm my real desire is for them to come to know Christ? And so being incarnational in the way that we live and just kind of being there and realizing that we may not be the, the end of the story. I think about the, you know, the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus, Jesus, as he's walking away, Jesus doesn't chase him down and say, Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, like right. we, we can still work on this. Um, he, you know, turns him away and lets him just kind of sit in that. In fact, it's on my top 10 things to do when I'm in heaven is to see if the rich young ruler is there, because I actually believe that the end of the story was never recorded. And I believe, oh, interesting. I, I personally believe just reading that, that he went away and really wrestled with it. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised if eventually he came back and became a follower of Christ. That's, that's, huh. that's what I want to believe. And it's one of the first things I'm going to do when I'm in heaven is uh, say, Hey, whatever happened with that rich young ruler guy, <laughs> you know, is he here? And uh, cause I have a feeling he is. Yeah, well, um, I don't know how to respond to you having a feeling about who's going to be there. <laughs> Mark, sometimes you're sometimes you have fascinating ways of thinking, but but no, nevertheless, again, this is one of the reasons I love your 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 book. It's got that kind of storytelling ability in there. Okay, so let's get to a, a hard topic. Yeah. Is the topic of um, deconstruction? Yeah, and of course, you address that some. What does your research tell about us? Tell us about those who are or have deconstructed. The Setzer Church Leaders Podcast is part of the Church Leaders Podcast Network, which is dedicated to resourcing church leaders in order to help them face the complexities of ministry today. The Church Leaders Podcast Network supports pastors and ministry leaders by challenging assumptions, by providing insights and offering practical advice and solutions and steps that will help church leaders navigate the variety of cultures and contexts that we're serving in. Learn more at churchleaders.com slash podcast network. So, you know, not only did we find that, you know, in general, practicing Christians are less curious than those that are spiritually curious, we also use something called a need for closure scale, which basically says, do I look for information, seek information to basically close things and find certainty? And how comfortable am I with ambiguity? And practicing Christians are surprisingly like there's a 10% difference between the, the general pop U.S. population and practicing Christians in terms of their need for closure. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a high need for closure. There's, it's not a pejorative thing, but it's something for us, especially as leaders, to think about in terms of what kind of a culture are we creating in our churches? 
Um, because if our culture has a high need for closure in the way that we're, um, you know, putting on our programs and everything like that, spiritually curious people are never going to be comfortable or interested in being a part of what it is that we're doing. And so it's something to think about. And so as we think about deconstruction, and as I looked at that high need for closure, and I think about all the people that I've talked with and journeyed with in their deconstruction process, a lot of them younger people who I've typically worked with, um, a lot of it was just simply that nobody was willing to really sit with the questions and the doubts that they had in the moment. They either tried to give them bumper sticker answers to the questions that they had, or um, they shame them for even having questions at all. And I would much rather journey with somebody in community that's having questions and doubts than to have them take their faith on the road outside of the church. And we've had a lot of that over the last 10 years, uh, especially as young people have struggled with Christian nationalism and um, those types of issues in the church. And they start raising questions and they're shut down or shamed or, you know, given bumper stickers and they, they walk away. So I think we have to really think about the curiosity culture that we have. And are we missing out on the wonder of who God is because maybe we aren't as curious spiritually as we should be? Um, within a you know a Christian framework. Yeah. So what? Are, yeah. W- to be curious within a Christian framework yeah. is what does that mean? Like, what would that look like? How would I be curious within a Christian framework? Yeah. I mean, I'm curious about what Anglicans believe about you know the the, the articles. I'm curious about you know Pentecostalism and the Charismatic movement and splits between the two. So that, that's when I think of curious. But in this is this is a case you're trying to reach spiritually open and curious people. So. What does it look like to be curious in that setting? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, we were talking about Augustine and, and, you know, he had the curiositas, right, that uh, he he actually kind of framed as a a negative thing uh, that could open up our life. Yet he was a very curious person. Um, So curiosity sometimes been framed negatively in our church culture. So we're afraid, well, if I'm exploring or or looking or asking questions of these other things, somehow I might lead me down a wrong path, or I might, um, you know, lack integrity, or I might fall for an untruth. And we get so obsessed with the truth as an idea that we forget that the truth is a person embodied in Jesus Christ. And, um, and so seeking him in every aspect of our life is really important. But if you even think about like art and Christian movies and things like that, um, you know, a, a high need for closure is going to create art that's more concrete and specific that lacks so you're room gonna end up with the God's Not Dead movies that end a certain way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, well, I remember some friends of mine made a pretty popular movie and uh, one of the distribution companies said, you know, you don't have this really clear moment where there's this conversion experience where somebody prays to receive Christ and, you know, the Christian community loves that. But they were like, well, that's not really kind of how this journey happened in this person's life. Uh, it was a, a, a process over time of this transformation that t- took place with a moment for sure, but they didn't want to say, oh, you pray this prayer and then all of a sudden you're not an abusive father anymore. Right. Um, and so, th- and they actually lost the distribution deal on it. And it turned hmm. out to be one of the most, one of the higher selling movies, you know, of all time. Um, and I can only imagine what it is, but, uh, yeah. but, but it was interesting to, um, you know, to sit, I, I, to see I, them I struggling it. with the storytelling. Did you get it? Reference. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So okay. that, that was kind of an interesting thing though, to watch them on that journey and how there's yeah. this desire to, Hey, Christians really like this. And they're like, but it's not real to the rest of the world. It re- rings right. authentic. And they wanted the larger audience to also hear the message of, of, of that good news. So. Yeah. So I think being curious yourself, it's not necessarily, I'm curious how tarot cards work and I want to, you know, practice those and see right, what the result right. is. But, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, uh, but I'm curious I, why other people are interested in them and what, yeah, no, exactly. what they're so I, seeking you know, I, to get answers from, right? And that's I, a difference. I ended up, yeah. Right now, I have a particularly short haircut, which sounds strange to beginning, but stay with me. <laughs> but part of that is is I'm in a kind of sharing the gospel relationship with the guy who cuts my hair, uh, the salon owner. And um, and he's um, not, not a believer, but has spiritual questions. And so I've spent a lot of time. Uh, asking him those about that. Mm-hmm. And I was curious about, well, how did you get to that place? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And and then uh, I shared what, what I believe in my faith. And, and he's at, we're actually now planning time for him to come to church and bring his kids and et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think though, if I hadn't, 
and again, this is partly key. So, I mean, I've been my guy, been my hair guy for six months. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the reason my hair is short is we ended up in this longer conversation <laughs> this time about the Lord and about what's next. And, and he just kept using the opportunity to shorten my hair. So, so you know, there, there are consequences to yeah. actually having spiritual conversation. And you'll probably get your but, hair cut more often, too, so that you can uh, you exactly, know, build the exactly. relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, but I, but I do think the curiosity there made a difference as well. So I love you keep coming back to, yeah. so how do, how do believers currently try to reach the spiritually curious people and maybe contrast that what we do need to actually do to engage them? Yeah. Yeah. So as leaders, you know, practically, how do we do that? You know, do this one is teaching our people to ask spiritual discovery questions. Um, you know, love that. Uh, and so I think that's a, a real important thing. I talk about this in the book, but like just being curious about people and knowing how to look for certain cues in their life. Um, so, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people and we're just on a plane and we're just talking about things, you know, it'll come up, you know, maybe that I'm a Christian or a minister or whatever. Um, and, and I always am careful sometimes how I lead like when they go, so what do you do for a living? You know, sometimes I'm an author. Sometimes I'm a nonprofit executive, you know, and I'll let the truth about me come out in time uh, because sometimes that can be a conversation ender. I just kind of feel the, the, the spirit in that moment. But, um, but, but like if they have tattoos, I find that, that people love to talk about their ink. And a lot of times their ink uh, leads us to like really deeply personal moments in their life where they wanted to commemorate that by marking themselves, or maybe there's a spiritual symbol that has meaning for them. Um, if the conversation to, I find, you know, that people don't get to talk about spiritual things very often. So they're very open to talking about it most of the time. Um, especially when I'm curious about what they're interested in, as opposed to telling them what I know. So, um, so first of all, just knowing that, 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 I have a high probability of having a good conversation with people is huge. But, um, but another question that I'll just ask them is, Hey, is there ever a person in your life whose spirituality you really admired? And you will literally see people's faces change. Like they hmm. will, it's good. Their countenance will shift as they think about that person. And I mean, for Americans, nine times out of 10, it's a Christian and it's usually like a grandparent. Um, and they will talk about that person. And then I'll just continue to just explore that with them. A lot of times my spiritual discovery questions lead to the other person actually asking me to tell them more about Christianity rather than me having to impose that on them. Um, just because of that posture of fact for Yom Kippur, um, there was a Jewish woman that I was having an interaction with on an airplane. She wrote me it's a year later. And she just said, I'm, I'm reflecting on Yom Kippur, on great moments that I've had. And I just keep going back to the conversation that we had on the airplane. And she had written this beautiful children's book about a butterfly. And we just connected about the meaning of this butterfly, the spirituality of this children's book that she wrote. And, you know, here she's hunting me down, tracking me down um, to tell me about what's happened since that moment. And I thought, wow, you know, but it was just being present with, with her in that way. So that's, so spiritual discovery questions, that's a real important thing. And they're in the book. So they're in the book, but well. yeah, but, yeah. but even, you know, we, you know, the book just scratches the surface of this issue, right? right? It's providing the foundation. We've got a lot, but of, it's got some, I mean, got a lot I would say it's got, I don't want you to underplay your book. I think spiritual discovery questions are helpful. And again, yeah. the book is faith for the curious. Yeah. How an era of spiritual openness shapes the way we live and help and others follow Jesus. But you're, you're going on say that there's more ways than just there. Yeah. And then the other thing we have to think about is how we present the, the content that we have. So one of the things that we were doing with the American Bible Society is we were looking at, you know, like, what are people searching for when they, you know, search uh, Google for the Bible? Uh, uh, you know, what are they looking for answers on? And one of the top 10 things people search for is what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? Hmm. And um, so I asked pastors uh, in a workshop, you know, so you know, knowing this, that people are kind of curious about dinosaurs, what the Bible says about, it, how would you respond to that? And they all said, oh, I would do a sermon series on what the Bible says about dinosaurs, right? And we, it's kind of like, you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So, yeah, um, so I said, well, <laughs> don't judge us. Yeah. Don't judge us. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, how would we like, how would like think about a curious person that maybe doesn't believe in the Bible? How would you want to approach that with them? And they really struggled to think beyond putting a sermon together and presenting their perspective. 
And so I started thinking about it more as, you know, how do we help present truth to people in a way that's a little bit more like a museum? Because one of the things that our research has shown is that spiritually curious people, um, they want to have agency in their spiritual uh, discernment process. Um, They are so, in this post-truth culture, they don't trust other authorities and sources. They want to be the agency. It doesn't mean you know, that they can like Russell Brand go through the buffet line of beliefs and choose what they want on their tray. Uh, we're, we're not talking about a faith that, 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 that people can make up their own thing, but they need to have agency in the process and the journey of discovering. And um, the, the pastors were so worried about how they might perceive the book of Genesis and origins that I realized, I, I just asked them, I said, do we really have confidence in the truth of the Bible? Or are we so worried that people can't handle the truth that we have to interpret and and can we give them agency to explore on their own and maybe look at some ideas that we might not be comfortable with and where we've come to the conclusion. We give so many manufactured interpretations that we've worked through and processed deeply that we forget that other people need some time to also go through that. And, um, and for a lot of pastors in this workshop, their eyes were opening up going, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking like, I'm going to do all this work and then present my findings rather than realize that for the curious people, the journey that I went on is really what they're interested in. And so figuring out how to become co-learners with people and having absolute confidence in the word of God as the truth, absolute confidence in the, the the living Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in us that we don't need to worry about like them going off the deep end. Like the truth is they're going to find it if they're seeking it. And, um, and then we need to create that environment that allows them to find that. And that's a, that's a paradigm shift for the way that we think about content is that music. It really curated. is. And I would say, you know, cause I think a good podcast has a little disagreement. I, I, yeah. I, when you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, we memorized our gospel presentations I, and you expressed concern about that. I actually don't disagree that we could use our gospel presentations wrong, but I just don't think we've memorized our gospel presentations. Well, that's true. I think it would be a better Christian world if everyone had a gospel presentation in the back of their head that they could fall back to, uh, but then would in kind of a relational, organic sort of conversational way. But, and, and I guess, that, so So we're, we're, we're going a little long actually, but, but I like this topic, as you can tell. So we're about to do an announcement here at the Talbot School of Theology related to some significant evangelism initiatives that uh-huh. we're about to launch. And and I, I'm going to include your book in some of the... Re- well, not just because you're a Biola person. Yeah. We're, we're glad to have you as a Biola graduate. Uh, but uh, but so here's, the, here's what I want to close with. So I'm of the view that most pastors bemoan that they don't have an evangelistic church when they themselves are not evangelistic. And so, um, you, and I, I, I believe you can't, you can't live what you, uh, you can't lead what you won't live. You know, just old cliche, you can't lead what you won't live. So, and for a lot of pastors though, and I think for a lot of people, what happened is they found that the tools of the past that maybe those memorized evangelistic presentations mm-hmm. didn't work like they used to. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you, I mean, statistically, I could show you they were making a big difference at different times in the past. Yep. But yeah, now I, I totally become, agree, by the way. Yeah, 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 for sure. And they become maybe, you know, missiologically less aligned with the current cultural moment. So what I would say to people is don't get, don't just give up and say, well, you know, the evangelism doesn't work. No, maybe we need new ways to kind of find, to share, to communicate the good news of the gospel. So back to the pastor thing. And this is, I'm, I'm the worst question asker because I'm setting this up a very long way. Uh, <laughs> I was convicted of this in my own life when I was flying around the country telling people to live on mission. Mm-hmm. And I made a commitment to the Lord and I pray regularly, Lord, give me the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody in person once a week. Mm-hmm. And then I look for those opportunities and they almost always feel like some of the things you described in your book. Mm-hmm. It, 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 and again, I, if I, I actually do go to a gospel presentation, there's an openness, but it feels a lot more like a conversation with curiously open and, you know, conversation, faith for the curious. Mm-hmm. So I want to say the pastor and church leaders, you know, the, probably the, you know, the, the, the Sunday school teacher or the small group leader is less likely to listen to this podcast, but most people listen to our church staff. I'm of the view that it's actually easier when you're church staff because people, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor, you know, and or whatever. And then that's everyone knows that the conversation is now there before you. 
Um, but I recognize too, that when I walk in places like in the South, people hide their beer. When I walk into places, I, yeah. I get that as well. Yeah. So, so what can pastors and staff, you, this is space you've been in. What can pastors and staff do to engage people who are open to faith? What are some good next steps so they can make this a pattern? And then pastors, then you got to tell your people how you're doing it, invite them to do it. But what, what would you say? Mark? Yeah. You know, back in the early two thousands, I actually was a part of uh, DCLA for youth for Christ. They're kind of evangelism super conference. And we introduced this idea there that uh, has now become the logo for youth for Christ, but it's three story evangelism. Yeah. It's a really simple paradigm, and um, but it's basically start by asking people what their story is. So that's the curiosity part. Um, that will naturally lead to an opportunity for you to ask permission to tell your story, to share how you came to faith. I think that's really important, too. It's not just having the, the gospel presentation right, but having your experience right, because that is that speaks a lot louder to the curious generation is your experience than what you say the Bible says. And then after you share your story, you share with them God's story. And so you connect them there. But, uh, but, but looking at hearing their story helps me know how to connect them to God's story, uh, how to draw those lines. I think that's as the leader, what we have to, what we have to help people do. And it's not easy to teach, you know, it, it's, uh, there's an intuition about it. You've got to actually practice it. Um, and so it's, it, it makes it a little bit like less neat and clean when we are trying to build a workshop around it. But it's really important that we teach those skills uh, to people is how to sit in that, that presence of, you know, Hey, it's okay. If uh, this conversation doesn't go the direction that I thought it would, it's all right. God, this is part of what God has in this person's life overall. But I think you're right. Everybody should have and be able to lead somebody to Christ with a presentation. It's just what do you put in front of it to get to yeah. that place? Yeah. I often say to people that evangelism is telling people about Jesus. Missions is understanding them before you tell them. It's way more than that. Yeah. You know, but yeah. but but don't miss that. So yeah, it's so fertilizing before you sometimes harvest, it, right? And exactly. And that's and what so, the curious so I think are. It's fertilizing. I want though I want people to think missiologically about their evangelistic conversations. And I think I and I'm gonna let me just say to you to the folks, faith for the curious, how an era of spiritual openness shapes the way we live and help others follow Jesus, I think will helpful will be helpful for you to understand the cultural moment and to engage it well. So, because uh, I think there's an opportunity. So I think the fields are wide under harvest. Uh, Mark, 100%. thanks for taking the time to be with us. We appreciate you. Yeah, hey, thanks, I appreciate it. We've been talking to Mark Matlock. Be sure to check out his book, Faith for the Curious, How an Era of Spiritual Openness Shapes the Way We Live and Help Others Follow Jesus. You can learn more about Mark at markmatlock.com. Thanks again for listening to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcasts. And if you found a conversation helpful today, I'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.